Canada become a global superpower? Only if we learn to think for ourselves. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the podcast. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his deputy, Chrystia Freeland, have a rather small view of Canada when it comes to our role in the world and on the world stage. They love to repeat their silly little talking point that Canada is back when the Liberals returned to power in 2015. To them, Liberals are the only ones that can represent Canada on the world stage. Their perverse ideology that puts internationalism ahead of Canada's own national interest rules the day. They believe in something called stakeholder capitalism, where companies as well as governments aren't focused on things like innovation, jobs, growth, taking care of the population, taking care of the people who work for the companies. No, no, instead they focus on social justice, climate change, mass redistribution of wealth, and something called equity. The more woke, the better, according to them. Canada is one of the only countries in the world, one of the only countries in the history of the world, to routinely sacrifice its own nat national interest in order to virtue signal. We tie one hand behind our back, economically refusing to develop our own natural resources, and rather than focusing on a grand vision for Canada, rather than focusing on big national projects, we instead focus on little small things like gender ideology, climate alarmism, censoring the internet, and recently stoking division over the issue of COVID. Back in 2017, in a speech that was much applauded by the legacy media, then Foreign Minister and World Economic Forum Executive Christia Freeland gave a speech calling Canada a middle power. That's how they see us, an irrelevant third-line role player, not a superpower, not a relevant figure on the world stage. Well, my guest today has a much, much bigger vision for Canada. His latest book is called Canada Must Think for Itself, 10 Theses for a Country's Survival and Success in the 21st Century. And in it, he lays out his vision. So I'm very pleased today to be joined once again by Dr. Irvin Studen. Irvin is the founder and editor-in-chief of Global Brief Magazine, one of the leading international policy thinkers in Canada. He has been a public policy professor and has worked for Canadian Prime Minister as well as an Australian Prime Minister. He holds a bachelor degree from York University. He's a Rhodes Scholar with master's degrees from Oxford University as well as London School of Economics and a PhD from Osgoode Law School. So last month we had Irvin on the show to discuss Canada's post-COVID recovery strategy. It was a great interview. I really encourage you to go check that out. And we also talked a little bit about Canada's role in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. So Irvin, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you. It's great to be back. I enjoy your work. Thank you. So, so tell us a little bit uh, about what differentiates uh, yourself and your vision for Canada from the current the current government and people like Chrystia Freeland who call us a middle power. Well, I offer ten theses for people to consider, uh, not on a discrete basis, but all together, in terms of our ability to really survive, which is not obvious, and succeed in this century coming out of the pandemic. Now, the starting point, of course, from, for, for the book is my worry about the very survival of the country before success. And that is counterintuitive to us in Canada, at least it was before the pandemic, the idea that Canada may not survive in the coming decades. And one just needs to do a calculation, which I do in the book, about the average lifespan of modern states. And they, they tend to be 60 years old or, or younger, after which they collapse through one of two forces or two forces combined. One is domestic collapse, constitutional collapse. The second is external collapse, war or something like a pandemic. And God forbid you should have two of them combined, you'll collapse that much faster. Now, Canada is well over 150 years old. That means we're pressing our luck on, on the logic of things. That means beyond luck, we'll have to be very hardworking underpinning that hard work is thinking. We just can't work and we can't just say we're thinking because we're educated. It really has to be combined in a strategic framework. And that's the overall spirit of the book. I offer the architecture of our exit from the pandemic and how we can really survive given the wicked domestic and external circumstances and then really flourish as a major country this century. I remember there's a very famous essay written by Francis Fukuyama in the 90s called The End of History. And the idea was that everyone will come to the position of Western liberal democracy. And that's kind of the end point. And there won't be much left in terms of, of disputes and, 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 and those kind of things. So I think people have that mindset. It was a very influential essay. And, and people just think, 
you know, Canada is a stable country. We're a Western liberal democracy. We've got it figured out. And now it's just about kind of managing what we have and, and, and not letting it go. They don't, they don't really think of Canada in terms of having threats, having enemies, that there being existential threats to our country, aside from perhaps secession movements, separation movements. Uh, wh whereas even then, the idea would be Quebec would leave and Canada would continue to be a functional country. Uh, you, but you, you, you see things a little different, that, that, we, that we do have threats, that there are potentials uh, that, that, that could end Canada as we know it. So um, maybe you can walk us through what, what you think the biggest threats are to our country. Thank you very much for, for painting it thus. Uh, that is a famous essay. And my father, who's an immigrant to this country, used to say Canada is a country where you need to invent problems. So one of the differences between my thinking, to go back to your first question, the thinking of the current government, indeed of recent governments, is that, is that I start analytically rather than saying I have a good idea for Canada. The analytical point needs to say what are our existential problems and challenges? What are the problems then to us succeeding the over and above existence? The existential consequences are wicked. Coming out of the pandemic, we have, as I mentioned in our last interview, which I enjoyed, um, seven or eight systems crises, really wicked systems crises that we need to manage concurrently and they're existential in nature if any of the systems really collapse outright. I mean, we're talking about mass, not just death, but the collapse of the country. Domestically, we have four national unity problems, which any of which could collapse the country in the coming decades. Uh, first, the Quebec question, which is alive and well and could turn at any point. It's an ongoing thing to manage, but it is quite sharp coming out of the pandemic because a pandemic because Quebec has had a very different psychological pandemic than the rest of the country. But for certainty, if Quebec should ever leave, whatever one feels about that question, I, I love Quebec. If Quebec ever leaves, that's the end of the country. That's the end of the country. The second uh, pressure point is the Western question, which is less existential and more affecting our ability to succeed and thrive as a country, but is a wicked question, uh, which I'll address, I think, in my remarks in, in the keynote in, at Civitas in Calgary. The indigenous question makes it very difficult to govern the country coming out of the pandemic. And the final one is that we have these internal borders pockmarking the country physically, psychologically, and in regula regulatory terms coming out of the pandemic, such that New Brunswick could close off one day, say, only New Brunswickers welcome. The North could close off to the rest of the country. Well, we have a country we don't. And it takes a century and a half to smooth out this, this federation and only a couple of years to collapse its internal cohesion, which before long could, could tend towards separatist movements and disintegration. Externally, you mentioned Fukuyama's famous essay that liberal democracy had won. But I think in retrospect, Fukuyama was, was gravely mistaken because if you ask who between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev won the Cold War, my answer would be Deng Xiaoping won the Cold War, that it was not the Soviet Union or the West uh, democratically. For now, it's China and the Chinese model that, that is central coming out of the pandemic, whether one likes it or not, it's irrelevant. It's an, an objective fact. And in the way I paint our geography, China is very close to us on our Western borders. The geography between Shanghai and Whitehorse or Shanghai, where, where you're originally from, uh, Vancouver or, or Prince Rupert or Victoria or Shanghai or Nuvik or Shenzhen uh, Yellowknife is smaller. The distance is physically smaller than that between Sydney and Shanghai, Australia. So if the Australians say they're in Asia, which they have for the last several decades, we're even more in Asia on the Western border. Through our nor Northern front, the Arctic is melting. I'm not here to say we're gonna reverse climate change. Climate change is, is a reality at our North. So the, what, the North is opening up. The neighbor that we're exposed to all of a sudden is the one that's at war with Ukraine, we imagine to our East, but is immediately to our North, that's Russia. We have America to the South and we have Europe to the East. These are four new wicked borders in their totality, A-C-R-E. America, China, Russia, Europe. And I want to commend that to all your listeners because it's a key part of my second thesis in the book. Our borders are ACRE. These are all great powers. They're far bigger than us. They're far more energetic. And in their combination, they could crush us or pull us apart very fast in 15 different combinations. So the domestic pressures and the external threats combined mean that we're going to really have to up our game. And that's where the thinking for ourselves happens. Because no one, as you'll appreciate, Candice, no one around the world is saying, how can we 
do something for Canada? How do we help Canada survive? Only we can think for ourselves. And it's not obvious that we're there. We're going to really have to up our game and fight for our lives. And then I suggest later in the book, and we can get to this, that in fighting for our lives, we will become a major power in our own right if we make it. Well, you definitely lay out the the, the threats that we face, and and in the, in them could easily be opportunity. I mean, to go back to the idea that Western separation uh, is is a is a threat, perhaps not an existential threat. I I, I would say that it's a more serious threat. Uh, than any of the other ones. I mean, uh, I, I, well, I, I think I think also the Aboriginal one because it it it, it undermines the very uh, legitimacy of of Canada by 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 calling us a colonial uh, settler state and and saying that Canada is illegitimate. Uh, I mean, I don't know how you can really survive if if you think that way. And it seems like many many people in our institutions, leading institutions, believe that Canada is, is illegitimate over this Aboriginal question. When it comes to the West, though, uh, the the idea that that we have this resources, natural resources sitting there untapped, undeveloped, intentionally, purposefully. We have a leadership leadership in this country that does not want to develop our natural resources because ideologically it feels that we have some other greater uh, responsibility to the planet. Uh, no other, no other country thinks that way. No other power thinks that way. Uh, in, in some ways, I think Canada is very stuck. Uh, but, but when you look at, at the North and, and, and conceptualizing Canada in the way that you do, I, I wonder if, if that could create more opportunities to develop natural resources, more export paths uh, to the North, to Russia, to, to China. Uh, that way, do, do you see it as, as a potential opportunity? And how can we take advantage of that opportunity? 100%. It is the actual fourth thesis of the book. I start with our, our pressures, our crises. Then I say that we only we have a dyad of, of, of futures and, and none of them is, a, is that of a middle power. A middle power is a slogan, but I, I prove in the book, I hope that middle powerdom is impossible for Canada. It is either major power, I'm not even saying great power, major power amongst these major powers at our borders by virtue of surviving or a deep vassal state really crushed and through all these major powers playing across our territory, our, our information space, our geography, crushing us, doing all the thinking on their terms. And in the end, because some of these major powers are either cynical or in the United States case, not sufficiently wise to, to, to do all our thinking, we could re live very miserably. And I would argue in the book that we are tending towards the latter, whereas the preferable is to be a major power and in doing so, lifting our boat, but requiring huge thinking. So the thinking, and you intimated very correctly, is that uh, amongst these threats, there's real opportunity. And the opportunity is through the North. And what I say is that uh, this Northern border, the R, part the C, part the A, is the Arctic border. Now, in the south, in Vancouver, in Ottawa, in Toronto, we imagine the Arctic as this frozen wasteland. But I want us to imagine the Arctic as Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, just another border because it's opening up. And that territory is as large as the entire European Union. Uh, Yukon is as big as uh, France. Northwest Territory is as big as France, Germany, and Ukraine combined. And none of it bigger than each of the other two. All told, the size of the European Union, almost exactly. Do the calculation. What is the population for that territory? It is 115,000 strong for a territory that is opening up objectively. That's the size of Ajax, Ontario, facing these giants at our border. Russia, 150 plus million people. China, a billion and a half. The United States, 330 million. The European Union, 500 million. They're all at our borders and all of them touching the Arctic. So we need to up our energy, that is human energy first, our demographic footprint, our political footprint, up towards the north, almost a shift away from the south, which we imagine to be the existential uh, re game that's, that's relevant. We need to up it. And instead of imagining that we're going to war against Russia, China, or the United States or the north, we embed them in a framework that is of our own divination. We create the thinking. And that's why the second, the fourth thesis called Canada becomes the center of the world through a city like Whitehorse, Inuvik, or Yellowknife. We imagine they become the Singapore of the North. And so we imagine 10, 15 years from now, 
business people, businessmen and women taking regular flights from the north to Shenzhen, to Shanghai, to St. Petersburg, to Oslo, to Chicago, just as we do through the south, because it's opening up. And if we don't do the thinking, other powers will do it for us. But if we do the thinking, we become filthy rich. And we also embed the, these countries in a framework of peace, because the total market through the north is seven times larger than continental North America alone. And we have geographic proximities that favor us. We just need to invest and do that thinking, have the courage to build the framework where other countries are favored to have that courage. They are the thinking countries, the term setting countries like the United States, like China, like Russia. These are countries that are hyper energetic. They're ready to build the framework and they're ready to vassalize us psychologically first. And I say we up our game. We will embed them in our own framework. So we have to move fast, but we need to see our geography and the opportunity first. I remember when I was in high school, I was fortunate enough to go on an exchange program to Europe. And so I was flying from Vancouver to uh, Frankfurt. And, you know, at the time I was 16, I imagined flying in an airplane all the way across Canada, all the way across the Atlantic and going to Europe. And I, I remember uh, watching a little airplane on the on the screen. And at one point, the pilots look out the window, you can see the Arctic ice caps. And, and it's like, oh, no, we didn't fly across the continent. We flew over, right? And that's that's how you get from the West Coast um, over to Europe in, in, in a flight. We don't really conceptualize Canada that way. Why aren't there flights that go through the North? Why, why, why don't we have more development up there? Why don't we have airports? Why don't we have the basis of the infrastructure up there? And how, and how do we get that uh, built? For the same reason that uh, you articulate that the West is the most wicked of our national unity problems, I concur. It's the first national unity problem I identify. The capital is in Ottawa. The capital is in Ottawa originally because the strategic threat of Canada to go back to our genesis and this idea of our borders were, was the United States. In 1867, Canada is created as the antithesis to the American project. That is just a constitutional reality. It's particularly in the first paragraphs of the constitution. That is why all of the major cities and all the major act economic activity limb the southern border, not because it is warm. Anybody who's been to, to Winnipeg or Ottawa uh, at any particular time outside of summer knows that it's not. we're not there for meteorological reasons. We're there because all the forts line, limbed the southern border because the Americans were the threat all the way to the west. So the railroad went east-west and the cities followed and the economic activity followed thereafter. And then the mythology of of climate as, as the reason that we're there because it's warm in the South and not in the North. And then the idea that the current mythology that the Americans are our enduring friend. Well, the Americans are our friend today, but in, in my read of things, they are just another country and they are thinking in their own interests. And one day that could turn against us, right? And even in annexation terms, and, and that should be understood, including through the North. So now we understand the North is opening up in a way that was not true over the last 150 years, just as China is relevant in a way that was equally untrue over the last 150 years. When Canada is created, China is just recovering from the, the opium war. So it's destabilized for the entire modern existence of Canada. Now Russia and China are right at our borders, as I just depicted. And so that border alignment, that border thinking needs to be shifted up from the American axis up to that AC axis. And Ottawa is not there psychologically. Ottawa, as we discussed, I think, in the last interview and, and even offline, has been self-isolating for two years. I mean, literally, they've been Zooming the entire country and imagining that they're governing through their intellect purely the second largest country in the world, not even understanding our geography, neither intellectually nor in a felt way. And I want, I commend to all colleagues, all patriots of Canada, that, to feel our geography. It is huge. Canada, we must appreciate. That's why I reject the idea of us ever being a small country. If you, if you total the, country, the geography of Canada, we are as large as the Roman, Persian, and Ottoman empires combined. That is the territory of Canada. That's how big we are. We are, we are empire size. We don't have an imperial mentality. Fair enough. I'm not for that. But we need to think commensurately with our geography because it is now opening up and we will be dominated on that geography if we don't play at the right level. As it's opening up, Ottawa needs to think, push its thinking up, up north. And in so doing, I also argue that they can address in a very meaningful way 
the Western problem, because much of the West is collect, connected to the North in psychological terms, particularly Yukon and parts of Northwest territories, Nunavut a little less. And there is a huge energy proposition there. There's a huge scientific proposition. There's a huge uh, transport proposition. There's an environmental proposition. We have a new university that's just come online through Yukon University. In 10 or 15 years, I'd like to see five major universities across the North, literally in the Arctic, one of them offshore. I'd like to see 10 million people living across the Arctic as it opens up by the end of the century. That's perfectly normal for geography that opens up and they'll have some, we'll have some major cities just as a century ago, Vancouver was a village and Montreal was superior to Toronto. These things change. So we don't imagine that tomorrow everyone will move to, to Toronto. I find it less attractive than other parts of Canada today anyways. But for strategic reasons, we're going to have to ship, shift our energy and get out there. Get out there en masse and see the country and, and build. One of the things that I took interest in, in, and this is really well documented in the U.S., was migration during COVID. A, a lot of people in the U.S. left sort of poorly governed blue states, uh, states governed by Republicans, places like California and New York that had really restrictive COVID policies, and they were also dealing with wicked crime uh, increases and, and just a growth in the cost of living. A lot of families left those kind of places and went to so-called red states, places uh, that, that, that had lower taxes, that had more job opportunities and that we're incentivizing people to come. I know uh, both Florida and Texas saw huge increases in, in their population. Uh, at one point, Florida was offering $1,000 bonuses to any police officer who wanted to move to that state. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't see much of that in Canada, though. Uh, there, there wasn't really a lot of migration. There wasn't really a lot of option when it came to wh wh where can I go uh, to escape restrictive COVID policies? Where can I go to raise a family in a way that I can afford? I, I know a lot of people leave Toronto because they just cannot afford a house. Uh, it, when, when I was reading your book and, and, and talking to you last time, thinking about the North, thinking about all of this land that we have, and, and yet not a lot of people, I, I wonder if there could be some kind of incentive for people like in terms of, you know, a, a place where you can go and raise a family, you can afford a single family home, you can have a kind of more traditional, simplistic lifestyle if, if you were willing to move up north. Uh, I, I wonder, have you have you seen any any politician talking about this kind of stuff? Any any sort of grand idea of how to move people to to places in this country uh, where they can have a better lifestyle uh, aside from, you know, every everyone sort of uh, congregating in and around places like Toronto and Vancouver? Well, we had a collapse in thinking over the last two years. The collapse in thinking over the last two years that you articulate is built on the general absence of real thinking in the years prior because we weren't forced by circumstances. As I mentioned, my father rightly said, until the pandemic, had Canada had to invent its problems in, in, a, in a comparative sense. We had small public tragedies, but we didn't have any war on our territory for the entire 20th century in any meaningful way. And we didn't have the Quebec collapse in the mid 1990s or the early 80s that could have also torn the country asunder and all of the other continents of the world had it. So now it's our turn, we're, we're, we, we, we are following the laws of history. So to think a country that thinks also says, how do we make sure that we have the right quantum of population, the right quality, and that people in our country are happy and dynamic and also are, are mobile across the territory by the way, when I talk about people moving to the north, I don't just talk about foreigners necessarily. It could be Canadians that see opportunity. And, and one of the things quietly, maybe even cunningly that I have in the book is that the north makes the demographic about which I'm most worried in Canada dream again. That's the young people. When you talk about the north and the future of the country, as I see it, that excites young people who have really suffered most over the last two years in Canada, in my view, unforgivably. It's exciting. You see the entire world, it is close to us, and we have the wrong imagination, the wrong imaginary from the south of the north. We imagine to be a frozen iceberg that's unlivable, and it's exactly the opposite. It's to be built, it's to be tamed, it's to be connected to the rest of the world. As, as I mentioned, the north connects us to a market of 7 billion people, seven, uh, sorry, 2 billion people uh, through the north, which is seven times larger than continental North America, and four continents. So then I imagine a young person living in the North can live just as well as, 
as perhaps you did or I did growing up in the big cities of, of the South with as much culture, with as much mobility, but proximity, they would take an overnight trip to St. Petersburg or Shanghai or Chicago or Oslo, as I mentioned, you wanna go to London or you go to another part of the North because I imagine the three territories connected so easily you go from Whitehorse to, to, uh, to uh, Inuvik overnight and you have a nice stay, you eat in a nice restaurant, you have some, some reindeer for, for, for dinner, you, you, give a, you, you, you take a course at the, at the, at the, the, the university in, in Northwest Territories and you go back home to a, a nice lifestyle. Now the cost of living is, is high in the North. It's actually higher than in the South. That has a lot to do with geographic distance, the fact that all the economic activity uh, is imagined to be in the South, but also through a lack of density of populations. So we're gonna need more people in the North, more people actually will reduce the, uh, the, the, the unit costs of, of housing and, and, and food in the North, not the South, and also the unit costs of transportation and make my life more interesting. It also serves our interest for sovereignty purposes and for the opportunity, I, I suggest, to have more people eventually move to the north, but as I say, it's not a it's not a painful proposition. I find it very exciting once someone understands that the the that it is opening up much like Canada did in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century for people who want to build a life for themselves. One of the things you hear about is that back then um, the government was offering land plots, like people were given plot of land or, 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 or some kind of a bundle incentive to, to go live in, in the West to develop Saskatchewan or, or you know, given some farmland in Alberta. Uh, can, could, you, could you see a program like that where, where Canadians, maybe even First Nations Canadians are incentivized by being given land uh, that they could go develop? Or, or w w what other kinds of things can we do to get, to get this plan in motion? A hundred percent. And, and, and you, you began to um, hint at that when you said that over the last few years, we've, we've actually lost a lot of people, a lot of good people in Canada and no one's keeping track. And we're, we're, we're loath to get them back because they're psychologically, they've moved on. It's a big loss for us. We've not had to work hard. And this is an area in which we're going to need to work hard to get the right quantum and the right talent. And there needs to be a very deliberate choreography. You can't just be, just fill the place up. I'm not for that, even for the South. I'm for very bespoke choreography, and that means business leaders, uh, civil society leaders, and government leaders getting on the phone, uh, getting out into, into markets, into, into other countries, into other parts of Canada, and recruiting actively. Make them offers that they cannot refuse because we want them. Now, we also have a, a very intuitive but incorrect psychology in Canada in respect to recruitment. We say, well, well, we'll come to the North when there's a job. And I say, no. We want the job makers in many cases. I remember uh, being at a conference in the Middle East and they were more curious about the Arctic than we are in Southern Canada. And they said, well, if I look at that geography, I think I could, I could employ a thousand people within a year. And that's the type of person we want in the North. We want the term setters. They come and we're as perhaps I and someone else don't see a job, a discrete job to be filled. They say, I'm going to employ a thousand people in the community from across Canada and from across the North within a year and multiply that. These are term setters, setters that will help us make a term setting future. And you talk about the indigenous population. They are in many cases, the term setters that we'll need, or they're the ones that will want them. There's some very, very energetic, ambitious, uh, self-governing first nations in the North that are very practical, that are, that are interested in talent. We just in a Canadian, very Canadian way, don't know how to make, offers. We don't know how to sell. And now we're going to have to learn to sell. Selling involves the thinking that I command in the work and thinking is goes hand in hand with the work that is needed to build up uh, that huge territory. Well, uh, one of the things that I, I read in your book, and, and I've seen this argument many times, and I, I instinctively reject it and disagree with it, is this idea that Canada should deliberately grow its population to 100 million people. Whenever I hear that argument, I think uh, of, of people who just sort of want to wholesale bring other people, other cultures, and displace Canadians or sort of ig ignore the Canadian population. Or, or is sometimes it's so condescending. It's like the idea is that uh, we need to bring other people in to civilize us and enlighten us uh, on, on other cultures and other values. And it seems that the people who lead these kinds of discussions uh, almost have like a dislike of the of the original Canadian population. Um, I, I'm wondering what, uh, what what your vision is and why we need to import people from around the world in order to, uh, why we need to get to 100 million and why we need to import people from around the world to get there. 
a lot of the hundred million arguments over the last uh, decade and a half start with my own work. It started as an idea proposition, just a thought experiment, but now I mean it very much in strategic terms. That is to say, on the current population of 38 million, we will be vassalized and poor, and that is our current trajectory. So we can tweet as much as we want. We love Canada. We're patriotic. We're democratic. But on the ground, we will become non-vital in economic terms, uh, politically less connected. And you mentioned the connection between Ottawa and the West, which is also, also has to do in part with demography and non-sovereign on our own territory and vassalized by other countries that are larger and more energetic. So it is also an energy proposition, human sense, more people, more energy, bigger companies, bigger markets, more transportation. I have, a, a, I think, a powerful table in there, which I talk about the basic thing of, of high-speed rail. We have the, the Japanese created their first uh, high-speed rail uh, lines in the 1960s. Then how many have we got in Canada in, in the year 2022? Still zero and zero for any foreseeable future. We're even where we're high speed rail is already passe and there's nothing uh, possible on that, on, on current demography, but with larger demography, we can not just have that. We can have, we can have larger capital markets, larger intellectual markets, uh, better, a better cultural space, but let's talk about the North. I mentioned that there are 115,000 people in the North for a territory that we control for now, the size of the European Union. That is a strategic nonsense. It is strategic nonsense given that the surrounding market is, is 2 billion people, that the immediate strategic neighbor for now a threat, I see before long uh, an opportunity. The Russians have 115 million people. If you juxtapose as I do in the, in the, in the book, the distribution of their population, of their 150 million people, they have 2 million plus in, on, the, on the Arctic front, facing our 115,000. And although they're larger, they're not that much larger to command such a disproportionate superiority in ratio. So we're going to need many more people simply to govern ourselves in the North. How many more? I'm actually indifferent between 80 million, 100 million, 120. They're, those are just quanta to make people think it could be 70 million. But we're going to need about 10 million in the north to govern ourselves to manage this huge geography that's opening up. And 10 million in the north means that we're going to need proportionately larger bases in the middle of the country. Now we're talking about places like Thunder Bay or even Churchill, Manitoba, further north, and down to the current large metropolises where we imagine, whether we imagine, uh, whence we imagine everybody, whether we imagine everybody. Uh, immigrant. We'll imagine that everyone's going to come to the GTA. I don't want everyone to come to the GTA. I don't want more neighbors. I want people to be properly distributed across the country through choreography. And I do want to maintain the majority minority equilibria that you talk about. There needs to be a very bespoke choreography. Uh, but we're not doing that. Even on the current immigration structure, it's very lazy. It's quite laissez-faire. And it has no appreciation of our geography and our sovereignty needs and the opportunities that I, that I talk about. Well, and, and it has no appreciation of, of the, the difficult work involved in integration, right? Like you, you talk about a threat to Canada being uh, that we could become a vassal state for all of these other more powerful countries. It's like if we just start importing people from those more powerful countries and don't give them any uh, guidance, don't give them any uh, integration into our country and just say, yeah, welcome to Canada. We don't really like ourselves. We don't have a lot of confidence. We have this horrible history and we're humiliated by it. Uh, come do whatever you want, basically. And that, that that's kind of the message delivered um, to newcomers. And I, and, I, and I agree that it needs to be more coordinated. It needs to be more deliberate um, if we're going to want to sustain the unity that, that we have, or at least build, build, build unity, continue uh, t towards being um, one, one, one country. So, so Irvin, just final question for you here. Um, you know, you spent a lot of time thinking about Canada. You, you, you kind of boiled it down here to 10 very succinct theses for the country. What, what is your grand vision for Canada? Where, where do you see Canada in 2050? Where do you see Canada in, in 20, uh, 2100? Um, and, and what do you hope for Canada? In the last thesis, the 10th, my favorite, <laughs> uh, I, I paint 10 steps for Canada post pandemic, by the way, one of which is interest would interest you. Personally, I talk about creating a, a special economic economic environmental zone for the entire west and north of the country to really 
give us uh, energy and to open our wings. I talk about movement of assets in the country, both political and economic, more to the west and to the, to the, to the north because of the China-Russia axis, which is, which is underserviced. Uh, 2050, I hope I'm around and vital. In 2100, I plan to be around and, and vital. I hope that Canada is around. It's not obvious. Canada is my team, so I'm always fighting for it and I, I'm thinking about it. I'm grateful, but now I realize that, that it's much more the gratitude that is required for us to, to keep fighting. I imagine us to be the second major country in the West um, in the year 2050, second only to the United States, larger essentially in both demography and power and influence and self-belief than any Western European country, any, any European country other than Russia, which by that point will have uh, different borders anyways. I also, however, ma imagine us to be connected very non-ideologically to all the major countries in the world. And this is a an essential point. I'm very non-ideological in my strategizing for Canada and must be so because if we're too dogmatic, we will get crushed. We can be dogmatic on tr Twitter, but we need to be, uh, I, I call it strategically promiscuous in our strategy. We need to have good relationships with all these border countries because otherwise they will crush us. And that's how a cunning, clever, calculating country that's at scale operates. So we'll have good relations, not just with the United States, but with uh, China, with Russia, with all the European countries. And then after that, with India, with Africa, all to our advantage, first and foremost, and survival. And then I hope, and this is my larger interest, in the service of, of humanity, which is the more interesting condition. But first and foremost, we have to do it through Canada, uh, which is, as I mentioned, as I as I as I commend in the book, worth fighting for. Well, that's uh, absolutely. I, I really encourage people to go and check out your book. Where where can they find your book right now, Irvin? Well, for the coming months, it's going to be an ebook, so they can check it on on the Global Brief uh, site. They can they can purchase it there or on the on the Institute for Twenty First Century Questions i twenty one cq dot com site. Um, and I hope uh, they love it. And before long, we'll be in, in print as well. And I'll be continue to talk about it. It's, uh, it's highly topical. And as Irvin uh, also mentioned, he's going to be giving a keynote address at our Civitas conference this year. So if you're interested in, in coming out to Calgary and, and seeing that conference, checking it out, uh, go, go over to civitascanada.ca. You can find out more information about the organization, about the conference, and uh, you'd be able to come and see Irvin deliver that uh, keynote address. So Irvin, thank you so much for your time. It's always so interesting to talk to you. Uh, thanks for sending me over a copy of your book. I really am enjoying it. I'm not quite done yet, but I'm, I'm enjoying uh, working my way through and I look forward to seeing you in Calgary. Me too. See you soon. Thanks for your work. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.